Coming up next on the best of RFD Maine, we'll hear how life just wouldn't be the same without the Franklin Trading Post at the center of town. And then we're off to the Korea Post Office, which has made a permanent stamp on the hats of those who live there. We'll see how both family and commercial farms are part of the familiar landscape of Maine. And we'll get a peek at Lucerne Maple Products in East Holden, where each year, Smoke from the sugar shack signals the turn of winter into spring. So stay with us for a slice of life in rural Maine, coming right up on the best of RFD Maine. Production of RFD Maine is made possible through a television demonstration grant from Rural Development, part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Maine is a state of geographic extremes, from the wilderness of the Great North Woods to dairy farms and orchards, from the coastal waters of the Atlantic to towns and villages nestled in hills and valleys of lush terrain. However different our landscapes, one thing rural communities in our state all have in common is the challenge of maintaining their rural way of life. And some of the things that make our towns rural are hard to describe without seeing firsthand. Hi, I'm Sandy Fippen, your host for the best of RFD Maine. As you can see, I'm standing in the facsimile of an old Maine country store. I was just reading in Alan Lockyer's wonderful book, Clam Diggers and Down East Country Stores, about how stores in Maine have changed. For one thing, there aren't as many as there used to be. Uh, my town of Hancock once had 12 stores, one in every neighborhood, but we're now down to three. But as you're going to see in the upcoming segment of the Franklin Trading Post, uh, stores in Maine are still basically the same. This one was started by Dave and Norma Albee, now operated by their son Jeff. And the characters that come and hang out there in the morning for coffee and donuts, Joe Carter, Bruce Carter, people I grew up with incidentally, still come there to see each other, pass the time of day while buying products and gas for their cars. Well, I don't know, this is a local gathering place. We all Any, know each other. Anything, yeah, and anything we need to know, we come up here and somebody will tell us whether it's right or wrong. Well, it fits the definition of a mom and pop store to a T. My mom and pop own it. Well, I come up you know, five or six mornings a week, not every morning. Sit down with the boys and have coffee and find out what's new in Franklin. A lot of stories go on out there. In the wintertime, we know what the temperature is every 10 seconds. Everyone's talking about that. Look, your friends are here. Friends meet and have coffee. Talk. We thrash it out. And we have it all solved when we leave here. <laughs> well, you get in your car and come over here. You cheer yourself up. <laughs> there's times when people just don't have any money around here. Like right now is a good time because there's mud season. And no one's cutting any wood. And they're not buying any clams and worms to speak of. Everybody's kind of in between. We're one of the places that. This is all reflected, you know, when things aren't going the way they used to. We see it firsthand. Someone comes in here and they're a little down on the luck or whatever. They might need five dollars worth of gas to get them to Elsworth so they can look for a job or whatever they want to do. You go into 7-Eleven, I doubt they give you the time of day, you know what I mean? We do that for people. You care about people around here, you get to know them. You know them by their first name. I know everybody in town by their first name, practically. But I like to uh, stop. Always have. I can remember back when there was probably four or five stores in this town all going at the same time. And now this is the only store. How come? 
You tell it, Ray, Ray, me. You well, sure. Me. All the difficult questions you want me to do. No, but you, you are a man of knowledge, and I ain't. Well, <laughs> no, but what, really? Well, I suppose it's the big business taking over. I think it's the old adage of uh, Walmart's moving in, and they have a lunch counter. Uh, they're able to underprice for a year or two, and then I believe after that, prices do creep back up. But meanwhile, their competitors have dropped by the wayside. But Eastern Maine does have a few of these country stores left, and I hope they do succeed, because <laughs> we need them. It is nice to have a little community store where people can get together and talk and have a good time and socialize instead of having to go through the fast pace. Well, there's a lot of people that uh, my age or a little older that's taken over for the parents, like I have, and uh, there's a lot of seasonal work around here. The summer things get real good because everybody's working everywhere. Everyone's making money. The restaurant's doing very well. For this time of year, it has been worse, and I think we're doing pretty well. You know, we put out a pretty good product, and people come back and like it. It's a great little town, you know, a great little store for people in the community, because they have no place else to go besides out of town to pick up the little things that they do need. If we didn't have a store in town, I think Shirley's expressed it quite clearly, we'd have to drive in there. Also. Well, sure. That's 12 we'd miles get away. Gas, we'd get our up. Positions with all bread and butter, and it is nice to know that if I only have to have a loaf of bread, I can come down here. Post offices in rural towns in Maine used to be just like this, with the post office boxes in the back of the grocery store or general store. Usually in front of them, too, would be liars' benches, where people would be sitting, waiting for the mail to get sorted, and where you'd have to walk between them to come get your mail and have everyone see what you got. Uh, in the segment that's just coming up now, you're going to see the Korea Post Office in Korea, Maine, a very small fishing village, which is still the center of the town. As one of the residents told me, it's still the only place in town where people can come within walking distance and meet each other every day. sponsoring Korea Post Office Day. So on behalf of, of the Grange, it is my pleasure to welcome you here this morning to help us observe the 100th anniversary of the Korea Post Office. It is a very important place because this is where people come to meet their neighbors and to visit and to get caught up on news in Korea. This is where they find out if there is somebody sick in the village or anything exciting going on. The most traffic I've ever seen in Korea. The post office is more or less a community center for the community and then it would people would have to travel, I suppose, to Prospect Harbor then to get their mail. So it, it wouldn't it, it adds to the community a great deal. And incidentally, the church is older than the post office is. <laughs> Actually, it's the only thing we have left. We had stores and so forth beforehand, before, and, and now the stores have all been closed, and, at, and the post office is the only thing uh, for the, for the people. For the people. On an afternoon like this, the men may drift toward the general store. This is their meeting place, a place to exchange the latest news and compare notes on the day's catch. They would, they would come, come to pick up the mail and perhaps buy a few groceries, talk for their friends, and so on. This kind of community feeling is the best insurance a man can have. because it gets too hot. In the wintertime, we complain because it gets too cold. And in between, sometimes, we complain about the postal service. But I... The postal service is sort of the, of the heart of the community now. And with, without it, um, we, would, we would miss it. We would miss the post, having the post office. 
You know, the old main post offices were a lot like these crank phones, which I do remember using when I was a kid. You'd have to call up the operator, and if she couldn't connect you with the party, she would tell you where they were, saying something like, uh, he can't talk to you now, he's down at the lobster pound, but she would leave a message and connect you later. Uh, family farm life in Maine was like that, all over town. That's how things worked, how things were linked together. In this next segment of the Littlefields family farm in East Benton, Maine, you're going to see something of that atmosphere, how everybody played a role, how they kept the farm going, how it was all linked together. I don't think there's another family in Benton that has stayed in the same place as long as we have. And it's always been a, it's always been a family farm. It's not been a profitable farm to, that you could make a living off them, but we've always had cows and made butter and the things that raised hands and as I was growing up. It's just a part of me. You know, something you, something you never could leave. It's peaceful, quiet. People don't do too much, lay back. It's about it. Farm life. If I get up, I'm busy. <laughs> I get up in the morning, I'm busy. We think we're on this old hay machine here this week. Get that ready, and then we'll be back into hay again. We all help hay. Everyone, the kids are around, because when hay starts, your life is settled right around farming. We've had more people come and want to buy that corn a lot because it's right across the church, it's right on the main road, and it's, it's, it's nice. And, uh, but I have no desire to sell it. What would I gain? I mean, once you sell it, it's gone. You, don't, you would never get it back. And when, when I'm gone, then my kids will take over. I was telling you before that we had a tree that I grew up in and my children all grew up in and uh, lightning struck it, and it killed it right down to the roots. And when it went down, it was like going out and there was such a total disaster because something you've had all your life was gone. And I decided I was gonna have a funeral for my tree, and I asked, called all my kids and asked them to come home, and they thought I had absolutely flipped out. We had that great big tree there. She flipped out. She lost her tree. She called every one of us up to have a funeral. And she got mad at one sister and said she was going to totally disown her. She didn't come out for the funeral. And Martha came out. We had hot dogs, the whole thing. And there was a lot of things happening in that tree, you know, fist fights and the swing. I mean, we had a tire swing that during fiddlers, every, I think every kid in this area swung on that tree. It's a little different than most festivals. It's a unique family gathering. In 72, a young man by the name of Greg Boardman and I understand he sings in your theme song or plays for your theme song. He came home from a, out to Ohio, he, where he had gone to traveling across. He came across this fiddler's contest. And he came back and he said, Ma, he said, boy, I'd like to do a fiddle contest in Maine. He said, just have an open place to go and sit and play the fiddle and have a contest and have a banjo contest. And I said, well, that's the farm, go ahead. That was how, that's how it started, no more than just sitting at my dining room table and him saying he'd like to have a place to fiddle. <laughs> There's somebody watching over us, really, because every year we put the stage back on its foundation again, start off and have another 40, 50 people up there playing music. Oxen are pulling animals. They're also working animals. They haul them off the fairs and they compete in the fairs for prizes and ribbons and all that. It's been a lot of fun doing it. But there's no money in it. If you don't do it for money, you wouldn't be in it. So just a hobby. I just think people have got to get to give more of themselves to others. I just think they have to, there's got to be more understanding and commitment and love amongst people. And if you don't give, then, I mean, you're the one that suffers because you're all alone. And you don't have anybody to help you. you know? that's, and that's what main tradition is. It's people friendly 
you know. You go by and see somebody broke down, you don't just drive by, you stop and help them. But go in the city, you don't get that. There isn't very many places you do get it except rural Maine. It's easy for me to identify with the next segment, not just because we're both maniacs named Sanford, but because of what Mr. Kelly has to say about his family roots down east that go back generations, mine does too, and getting educated at the University of Maine and thus leaving Maine for a number of years before coming back. What he also has to say too about the work ethic that we grew up with is true too. I tried to think back and, and know, you know, what these people were really like. I know they were tough and I know they had a great deal of courage to come down here from Damascus and there with no one else there, bring your family, build a house. I mean, that takes courage. Thomas Kelly Sr. Uh, bought uh, two lots, each were 100 acres, and he paid uh, five uh, Spanish mini dollars and five shillings for those two lots. He bought a lot for himself, which are 100 acres, and then he also bought a lot for his young son, Joseph, who was 18 at the time. And so that is the beginning of uh, this lot, and it's been seven generations now of Kellys that uh, have been occupied and have used this particular lot, and uh, I'm proud to be one of them. Currently, this is my house, but uh, it, was, it was a house that my mother and father uh, lived in from about 1932 on. Prior to that time, my grandmother lived here. Uh, and uh, somewhere in the early days of this house, it was the poor farm for Jones Spot. As I understand from stories my father's told me, that they used to have dances here on Saturday night with violins playing, and the doors all open, and they would dance through the house and the shed, and there, there was a barn at that time. And uh, I would uh, think that had to be <laughs> quite a nice time. I went to the University of Maine, and actually I got a degree in chemical engineering. And I moved on and worked uh, 26 years for United Technology, uh, um, working with aircraft engines. After working uh, 26 years, I said, you know, if I'm ever going back to Jonesport and do anything with those things, uh, you know, now's the time. And immediately when I came to Jonesport, uh, I just got um, uh, awarded a great deal of, uh, with pride now becoming chairman of the Maine Blueberry Commission. Show me that kind of uh, confidence was, uh, was very good. The land, as you work it a bit, uh, you take on you know, a great deal of uh, feeling for it, and you love to see the roll of it, and you love to see the trees, and you know, there's just some beautiful thing about it. But to our younger generation have lost a little bit, they, they, they go out now and they want to make a lot of money, which is fine, but they don't have the care for the blueberries. We used to have, we didn't want to damage the blueberries. We picked them carefully, you know. You, you worked them off the bush. You didn't uh, power rake them or anything like that. And if you did, if you left a blueberry, when I was growing up and you were picking for somebody and you left the blueberry, I mean, the owner would make it go back and pick a blueberry, one blueberry. <laughs> I mean, it was that. <laughs> that kind of uh, upbringing that we had in the blueberry industry, and I mean, you love blueberries. It has a lot of labor, <laughs> and I think we have a lot of labor. I'm not the only one in the blueberry industry that has that. There's most of our guys in the blueberry industry, gee, they're all in their 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, some 90s even, and they still blueberry, and they still have its blueberries, and it's demanding work. I have a son, 26. Uh, and I hope that he can do well with blueberries. And, um, but he has a different approach to it than I do. I mean, he, I think he, he prefers the, the mass production more than the tender love and care. Maybe I can change him. <laughs> you go out in the morning, just as the sun is coming up, in a field of blueberries that's got dew on them, and the blueberries are blue, and you think you're looking at a field of diamonds. You mean the sun reflects off the blue and you get the various colors like a rainbow. It looks like a field of diamonds to you. You never saw such a beautiful sight, you know, and, and, and you, uh, you got a feel for that. You knew it was springtime in Maine when I was growing up anyway, 
when the smelts were running. We'd have to go out in the middle of the night and go smelting in cold water. And my relatives and neighbors would be around tapping all the maple trees with buckets like this, some similar to this, and using boiling down pans like this, and ultimately a piece of crockery to put the maple syrup in. Quite different, quite, quite crude and primitive compared to what you're going to be seeing in the next segment with the Lucerne maple products where they're using high-tech pipelines to make today's maple syrup. When the spring comes, the icicles begin to melt and they drip. Uh, that tells me that maple season is right around the corner. I like boiling it down. I love the smell of it when it's cooking. It kind of grabs hold of you and, and you just want to lose your senses. <laughs> she says she's a widow during maple syrup season. <laughs> <laughs> it's just about uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, the sun's been out long enough now after, after a good hard freeze last night in the 20s. Uh, the trees are finally waking up. Maple syrup uh, is the first harvest of, of the year uh, for Maine, uh, second only to probably parsnips. <laughs> the season runs anywhere from February to the middle of April. It's very unpredictable. A couple of years ago, we had a real bad summer, and it was real dry, and the, and the syrup season was real short, and it, that, that kills you. The weather is the biggest and the strangest things that control it. I think we've gone from uh uh, soda bottles, to milk bottles, to buckets, to five gallon pails, uh, to where we are today, you know, on a fairly high tech system. Well, this is kind of a typical maple line in the woods on a pipeline system. Uh, we've got two different main lines going in different directions. We have some feeder lines or drop lines coming from the taps, from the trees, down to T's hooking in. And this will all be carried by gravity down the hill, down to a tank. Maple is not a dying industry, but it's not a really growing industry. Uh, there's just shifts and shifts and changes in the industry from small to large. Uh, if it wasn't for my family, my boys and stuff, uh, I probably wouldn't be anywhere as near as large as I am right now. But with their help, we continue to grow each year. And uh, hopefully someday we'll actually make a profit. It's going to be keep going because like my son and, and my grandson, I, I believe they'll keep on the tradition because they live on the same piece of land that where I live. And that, I live on the same piece of land I was brought up on. Lottie and Maple syrup producers, our family go back three or four generations on the same piece of land is it's, it's in your blood. It's just so nice and by being brought up with it from the time you're a little kid, it, it grows on you. It, it just grows and you can't get out of your, out of your system. It, it's there and you, you have to do it. Once you get the maple bug, you continue, you always want to grow. You always want one more tap, one more tree, uh, one more gallon of syrup this year, you know? It's just so much fun to make so many new friends over something that is so sweet. From the sweet taste of Maine maple syrup, we go now to the tangy taste of Maine cranberries. But before that, I just have to mention these products here, Hancock County Creamery. It doesn't exist anymore, but these are the products I grew up with. I used to deliver them at age 11 around my town of Hancock. In my book, Kitchen Boy, I also mention about how in all the small Maine communities, people had to be very diversified, have many jobs, many skills, as many as possible to make a living. Uh, in the upcoming segment, we're going down east to Callas, to the Mingo family, a good example of family diversification, where they not only raise Christmas trees and blueberries, but they're into the new industry of Maine cranberries. My grandfather, uh, my father, uh, grew up on a farm, always worked a farm. We grew up off the land, uh, worked the land, the land, uh, it's, it's, it's our living. We do a little bit of everything, blueberries, Christmas trees, uh, a campground, uh, construction business. We're diversified, you, you've got to be diversified if you're going to make it in Maine. 
I like farming, and this, this cranberry thing looked real good. And uh, we started talking about it, and I guess way back in, the, in 1990. So we, we decided to try it, and it, it, it's exciting. I, I love it. I'm down here every day. This year is going to be our first harvest, uh, and this is what uh, we've been looking for. And uh, we're real excited about it. Uh, being the first year, it's, it's, it's all new. Uh, and this bed only being planted last year, in, in June of last year, and to have berries here is really exciting. The, the demand is out there for the, uh, you know, for the berry, for the fruit. Uh, every day there's a letter that comes from, uh, you know, the bigger outfits out of Massachusetts or Wisconsin uh, wanting all the, all the main cranberries they're produced. They'd like to buy them all. What we need here in Washington County, we need more growers. There's power in numbers, uh, and there's only, you know, a handful. You could count them on one hand, really, the growers that there are in Washington County right now. And we need more. But there's a lot of interest in it, and we just keep that interest going. But uh, we can grow cranberries in Maine. I mean, it, this is living proof right here. It's, it's a great day, even though it's raining. It's a great day. We came in uh, uh, Sunday uh, and did what they call picking. The berry. We had a, a what they call a water wheel that goes in, and it turbulizes the water, and it, it hits the top of the vines after we put them. We've got about a foot of water on it. And it just hits the top of the vines and it knocks those berries off, and the berries float. And then we put a boom out. We corral them in, um, put them in a pen like you're seeing right now, and that's where we are at this point. It doesn't seem like there's a lot there right now, but uh, they're about six to eight inches deep in the water around the foam board. We're just going to pump the berries out of the boom board, where it's in the water, which is going to take water and the berries. It's going to be pumped right into the truck, which they'll be shipped right to uh, these ones here we're going to Massachusetts. We're excited about it. It's the first time that we've harvested, and it's uh, really our first crop, and this is the only bid that we're doing this year. And uh, for the, for the one-year deal, it's a uh, pretty good harvest. I just hope we continue to do the things we're doing right right now in this, this following year. I'm Sandy Pippen, and I hope you enjoyed the program and that you'll be visiting us again next time on The Best of RFD Maine. Be sure to visit The Best of RFD Maine on Maine Public Television's home page on the World Wide Web. The Best of RFD Maine was taped on location at the Page Farm and Home Museum at the University of Maine. Production of RFD Maine is made possible through a television demonstration grant from Rural Development, part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. I can remember back when there was probably four or five stores in this town all going at the same time. And now this is the only store. How come? You tell it, Ray, Ray me. Well, well sure. Me. All the difficult questions you want me to do. No, but you, you are a man of knowledge and I ain't. Well. <laughs>